This video is going to be a discussion of an essay in this work, Philosophical Apprenticeships by Hans Georg Gadamer, entitled The Origins of Philosophical Hermeneutics. Hans Georg Gadamer was a German professor of philosophy and one of the most influential philosophers of the 20th century. He was also a deeply cultured figure who always had a deep interest in the relationship between philosophy and poetry. He began mainly as a scholar of classical Greek philosophy, and one of his early interests was Plato's critique of the poets, which you'll remember from our earlier discussions in class and um, from reading The Republic, perhaps, in other classes. Uh, this initial opposition between philosophy and poetry really poisoned the well against poetry for many um, centuries in the Western tradition. And Gadamer was also a student of Heidegger. And so as a student of Heidegger, he was deeply engaged with Heidegger's attempted recovery of poetry as a valid conversation partner with philosophy, uh, and even as potentially a successor to philosophy. Um, a opponent, an intimate opponent to philosophy that could perhaps even do what philosophy was trying to do better than philosophy itself could. That was Heidegger's perspective, as we've seen in our past discussions of Heidegger in this course. So Gadamer followed Heidegger in engaging in philosophical interpretations of Herdelin and Rilke, but his most notable and in-depth engagement was with the uh, modern poet Paul uh, Ceylon, uh, who we're going to be looking at in future videos um, in the context of Gadamer's discussion of him. Ceylon was one of the most important post-war poets to write mainly in German, although he was Romanian by origin. But before venturing into that, I want to give some background in Gadamer's general philosophical orientation and his general view of the relationship between philosophy and poetry. And I'm going to do that in this video and in the uh, next video, which we'll be discussing an essay that appears in another work called The Relevance of the Beautiful on Poetry and Philosophy. Uh, in this video, there's going to be a focus in particular on Gadamer's general philosophical orientation and his general view of the relationship between philosophy and poetry as it arises out of that broad philosophical orientation. Now, the philosophical movement that he is most associated with is philosophical hermeneutics. philosophical hermeneutics. Uh, the name hermeneutics comes from the uh, god Hermes, who was the messenger of the gods. And it contains uh, this idea of receiving the divine word through um, a mediation of some sort. In particular, what we're talking about here is the um, science of interpretation. or the notion of interpretation as the basis of philosophy. So that's going to be the uh, philosophical transformation of hermeneutics from the mere science of interpretation to the notion of interpretation as the very basis of philosophy itself. And that's where you get philosophical hermeneutics. But originally, hermeneutics was understood to be a specific science, one among many, and by no means coextensive with philosophy. It was understood to be the discipline that explores the principles, rules, and methods of valid interpretations. And originally, this was developed, especially in relation to the Bible, and especially in Protestant countries, where you um, had the notion of a Bible-based Christianity in the first um, efforts were being made to establish the Bible as an independent authority, which required uh, doing things like establishing a stable meaning to the text, and that's where hermeneutics came in. So hermeneutics was always um, 
a science or a discipline that flourished in the uh, Protestant territories, which of course encompass much of uh, northern Germany. So originally hermeneutics was developed in relation to the Bible. Hermeneutics has always been uh, related to the problematic of understanding. This is more fundamental than translation. Uh, it's one thing to, of course, translate the Bible from, say, Hebrew or Koine Greek, uh, but it's quite another thing to understand it. And the more fundamental operation is understanding, because you can't even begin to translate something if you don't understand it. So we could say the fundamental question of hermeneutics is, how do I understand a text? How do I understand a text? That's what hermeneutics is concerned with. Okay, so how do I understand a text? How would you say I understand a text? What is a text? This is a question that we're going to come back to actually full circle and that helps to explain Gadamer's interest in poetry. But to begin with, just starting at a very elementary level, what is a text? What's a text made up of? Well, here's a text. What do I see? I see a lot of white, but I see some black there too. And what does that black um, represent? Well, it's words. I start with the words. Okay, so I understand a text by understanding a word or the words of the text. Is that enough? If I understand the words, do I understand the text? Well, obviously not. I need to understand the sentences, the specific sentences in which the words occur. So I understand words, but I understand words by understanding the sentence. Right? There's a wider circle, as it were, um, of sentences or a sentence that contains the word. So if I say something like, um, okay, I want to understand this word, bow or bow, which one is it? First of all, I don't even know if this is bow or bow if I just write it this way, do I? If you just came across it on the whiteboard, you wouldn't know whether this was the word bow or the word bow. What is this? Is this a tie and a ribbon? Is this a part of a ship, the bow? Or the bow, the bow, <laughs> part of the ship is the bow. Uh, is this a gesture of respect, a bow? Is this a weapon, a bow? There we go. Uh, is this a shape of a part of a building? Is this literal or metaphorical that I'm, you know, using this word? I can't answer any of these questions without knowing the sentence. Okay, well, so let's say I have a sentence and I, and I provide the sentence for this word. And the sentence is something like this. Oops. I don't want to say I read this sentence and I'm probably going to read it as the unexpected bow stopped him in his tracks. Probably, but not necessarily. Maybe it's the unexpected bow stopped him in his tracks. Can we tell which? How do I understand the sentence? Well, again, this reveals that understanding a sentence is not enough without understanding it in its context, in the context in which it occurs. What are we talking about here? Is this a sailing story? Um, are we describing a sailor walking across um, you know, a beach and encountering part of a ship uh, and being shocked and stopped in his tracks because he wasn't expecting there to be a ship there? Um, is this a detective story where a detective is investigating a murder that was committed with an arrow and he discovers in, a, you know, in the house of someone who he never suspected of being the murderer, um, a bow, a weapon? Um, is this uh, a, uh, a history of Japanese society? 
where the you know this um, like a, the emperor bows to someone who's a mere peasant, and this this person is stopped in his tracks with shock that the emperor would bow. You know, um, a famous episode, unknown episode in Japanese history, <laughs> the humble emperor. Who I mean, I'm just making this stuff up, but it just it, it must, it, it's to illustrate the context, uh, the importance of the context here. Um, so there's got to be sort of the broader story in which the sentence occurs or the broader text, if it's not, you know, the best understood as the genre of a story. Okay, so this suggests, of course, the important role of uh, genre attribution. We want to know the story, we want to know the genre of the story. Um, we want to know the origination of the story, a bunch, a bunch of different things that would arise in our attempt to understand uh, what the meaning of this little word is and what this sentence that it occurs in is and so forth. So what this points to um, within the discoveries of hermeneutics is the importance of holism. Holism, which is, this refers to the idea of the whole, the importance or the primacy of the whole in a certain way, that understanding requires the context of the whole text the entirety of the circumstances in which it's written, the historical con uh, conditions of its origin, the psychology of its author. All of these things are going to be part of the um, understanding. But these things, of course, that I've just referred to, um, so the you know historical conditions, the psychology of the author, as well as things like the genre, the type of story we're dealing with, all of these require interpretations as well. The whole requires interpretation just as much as the part does. And this leads us to um, this famous notion of the hermeneutic circle. Which is a circle between whole and part. In order to understand the particle here, the mere word, I have to understand the whole of which it is a part, not only the sentence, but also the larger context and the context of that context, things like historical circumstances, author of psychology. But I need to interpret these things as well. And in part, I'm going to interpret these things based on my understanding of what they're made up of, which are the particles. So I end up having to travel in this circle. And every time I travel in this circle, I have a hypothesis about what the whole is and what it means that I form and I test against the parts, but I have to also test my understanding and interpretation of the parts in relationship to the whole. So ideally we would be able to go, uh, we'd have time to go into more detailed examples of this, but we can't do that here. But hopefully that gives you a rough idea of how hermeneutics is uh, going to proceed. Now that, that's just the basic concept of hermeneutics. But we haven't yet talked about the, how this gets extended to become a method of philosophy itself. And we can begin by looking at um, a point that we already alluded to here, that things like historical conditions or the psychology of the author are themselves going to be uh, subject to interpretation. They're going to require interpretation in order for us to be able to understand them. And this suggests an, an idea, uh, namely the idea of the universality of hermeneutics that was first developed by Friedrich Schleiermacher. And um, I think I will not try to squeeze his long name on, on my whiteboard, um, take the time to do that. But uh, hopefully the, uh, the transcript doesn't butcher it too much and you can look him up. Um, if you just investigate the history of hermeneutics, uh, you, you'll find his name. Um, and the idea of Schleiermacher was this idea of the universality of hermeneutics, that hermeneutics actually um, is applicable whenever you're dealing certainly with um, the problem of understanding something, which of course is a distinct kind of problem. It, it's not necessarily the same as the problem, let's say, of being able to make reliable scientific um, predictions. 
So it, is, it, it applies especially anywhere where there's something that could be considered to be a text. And that gives rise to the question of where is that? Right? Where do we find text? Uh, we know the obvious example of text, but when we're dealing with something like the author's psychology or the historical circumstances in which the text was written, which is necessary context in order to have an understanding of the text, um, are we dealing just with a kind, an additional text? Well, I mean, in a sense, because context is a type of text, namely the context. Um, but of course, it's a, at a different level, uh, a different register from the, um, the object text here. But this serves to illustrate the way in which hermeneutic problems, hermeneutic questions can very quickly um, ramify out beyond where they originally um, began. Remember, we originally started out by just trying to understand the meaning of one little word, and pretty soon we're left with trying to understand the whole historical context in which this word occurs. Okay, um, now another issue that is connected here, and I don't want to say too much about this, but since the uh, end of the 19th century, especially in Germany, uh, in German philosophy of science, there's been an ongoing discussion about the proper method for the human sciences. And what's the better method? Is it hermeneutic, um, the method I just described, or is it positivistic, which is to say, uh, you know, statistical methodology, quantitative, based upon the model of the exact mathematical sciences like physics, chemistry, um, um, in geology, astrology, sciences like that. And so that question of is, what, how do we understand the, the, the best method of the human sciences? The, and the human sciences in a German context is a name that is a catch-all which would cover things that in um, the English-speaking world we would divide up into the humanities and the social sciences or the behavioral sciences. Um, and so those things, are, but they all deal with human beings. And so they could be grouped together under the heading of the human sciences. So, so that's, that's one issue that um, Gadamer um, is also going to be addressing in his philosophical interventions, which is the question of the proper methodology of the human sciences and the human, the hermeneutic method. And even, even the question as to whether I mean, in what sense this is a method at all? Because one of the things that Gadamer is going to emphasize is the way in which understanding takes place primarily in uh, dialogue. Um, and that refers, I just squeeze this in here. Um, this, this idea of the dialogical character of hermeneutics, that's going to be very key to Gadamer, the conversational or dialogical character of the hermeneutic process. So if we're aiming to achieve understanding, the model should be the way in which you and I, um, who are, let's say, strangers to each other, perhaps we're also from you know, very different backgrounds, very different cultures even, how do we come to understand each other? Well, obviously, uh, dialogically, through a dialogical process. We dialogue with each other. We, we converse with each other. We come to understand. And that model is, for Gadamer, the basic model of, of all understanding. And it serves as the basic um, methodology, if you will, for philosophy itself. But it's not really a methodology in the, or a method in the traditional scientific sense of method, the, the kind of method that someone like Rene Descartes was searching for, for example. It's, uh, it's not that kind of a method. Uh, it's more of an art, right? There's an art of conversation, an art of being able to dialogue. Um, and so it's very different from, and perhaps irreducible to science. It's, it's not possible to, um, you know, equate this dialogical or hermeneutical engagement with, with a text um, or with an other that aims at understanding uh, with the standard conception of, trial and error within a scientific laboratory. Um, they're just very different things. That's, that's Gadamer's perspective. Okay, let's go to this essay on the origins of philosophical hermeneutics. Uh, Gadamer says that the aim of this essay is to prevent, prevent, to present, rather, to present 
the motivation behind my approach as it actually developed. To present the motivation behind my approach as it actually developed. So we get a kind of uh, narration of how he came to this idea that um, interpretation is the basis of philosophy, interpretation to be understood in line with the um, hermeneutical tradition, and how he ultimately resolved this into the, this notion of a dialogical mode of uh, understanding. Well, he says, first of all, that the historical sciences and art were his starting point. So art, and of course we can extend this out to poetry, was always very important for Gadamer. Historical sciences and art are modes of experiencing in which our own understanding of existence comes into play, comes directly into play. Our understanding of existence. What is our understanding of existence? Well, here he means primarily our self-understanding of the condition of human existence, of, of what it means to be human. That's what he's talking about here. Now, the historical sciences, when he refers to the historical sciences, what he's talking about are the human sciences, because human beings are historical. We exist in history. And so to understand um, human behavior inevitably requires us to rely on history, because human beings exist in history. Um, and so we call them the social sciences and humanities in the U.S., but they're historical sciences. To understand, I mean, in the humanities, to understand in you know, scholarly detail a poem or a novel, you have to understand something about the historical context in which it occurred. That's, you know, um, par for the course. So uh, he calls them the historical sciences. Now, he starts... Um, to develop his own philosophical perspective by criticizing the supposedly disinterested and objective approach to historical and artistic knowledge. In, he refers to this dis, supposedly disinterested and objective approach to historical and artistic knowledge as our inherited and acquired historical education. This presupposes that we can arrive at a true understanding of historical figures and events, and a, a true and objective understanding, um, a kind of disinterested truth uh, on the model of which we can arrive at in uh, the case of physics, let's say. And the same with the meaning of works of art, that there's a kind of true understanding of what this work of art is, what its genre is, what its meaning is, and so forth. Um, and then we cannot arrive at this understanding without this knowledge that we arrive at, this disinterested, objective, objectively true knowledge, without this knowledge being affected by our own self-understanding and without this knowledge affecting our own self-understanding. So it's, it's the, um, from what Gadamer's perspective, is, an, is the illusion that we can stand in relationship to art and to uh, the historical knowledge of human beings in the way that the scientist stands in relationship to, let's say, a physical or chemical um, process as a kind of disinterested observer that is not implicated in that process, but that's observing it from the outside completely um, with a kind of objective truthfulness uh, to their perception. But that's not the way it is when we're dealing with um, art and with history. We are um, affected by what we learn and we affect the way in which uh, what we learned appears to us. Our own self-understanding affects the way um, the phenomenon itself appears to us. It interferes with, or, you know, if you want to put it more pejoratively, it distorts the phenomenon in the case of um, history and art. So uh, a couple of examples to clarify this. So we think about from history, uh, these are my examples. These aren't in Gadamer's text that we're looking at, but um, just to take a kind of straightforward example that hopefully wouldn't be too controversial nowadays, although it wouldn't be widely accepted or 100% accepted either. But uh, take, for example, the American Civil War. Can we understand the American Civil War objectively without this understanding or this knowledge of the Civil War being affected by our own self-understanding, by the historians make it personal, the historian's own self-understanding about what um, America is and what it is to be an American, which of course might be their understanding of what, what it is for them to be who they are as part of their identity if we're talking about an American historian. 
But if we're talking about, let's say, um, a Russian historian or an Iranian historian or, you know, a Chinese historian, we might have a very different idea, right, of what it is to be an American or what America stands for. And so the question is, you know, can, is there, is there an objective uh, understanding of the Civil War, knowledge of what the Civil War, that is not affected by the self-understanding of what America is and what it is to be an American? And without our knowledge of this war affecting us today, what we learn about this war, you know, can we remain untouched? Can, for example, one sense of American identity remain untouched, positively or negatively, by the investigation of the Civil War? It seems pretty, I mean, when you just reflect upon it, it seems pretty implausible that it can. You know, if I am, if I, if I am an American, I identify as an American, but I'm totally ignorant of the Civil War, how likely is it that if I get really deep into the Civil War and I study the Civil War in detail, how likely is it that my sense of what I am as an American is going to remain unchanged? Probably not very likely, right? That's, that's Gadamer's point, that our own self-understanding, our sense of uh, the human condition, the condition of human existence, what it is like to be a human, is going to be implicated in. It's going to be affected by. It's going to be involved in. Um, he describes it as being at stake. We are immersed in the game and at stake in the game. The game here being engaging in the process of historical inquiry or aesthetic inquiry. We're going to be um, at stake in that game. We might not come out the same on the other, on the other side. We're risking something, and we're we're part of we're we're, we're interested. That's the whole point. We're not disinterested in an objective, and the same is with art. So. For example, can I understand religious painting or the female nude in art or Chinese art or African art without this being affected by my own self-understanding, whether I understand myself to be male or female, uh, Western or, or not, uh, secular or religious? Aren't these identities going to affect my understanding of things like religious painting, the female nude, Chinese art, African art? That's um, the rhetorical question to which Gautama assumes we, when we reflect on it, we realize, yes, we can't be completely disinterested and objective about this. So the 19th century ideal of the historically conscious, disinterested, objective knowledge of art and history, which is still alive today in many mainstream intellectual contexts, um, is, in Gautama's view, an alienated form of consciousness, he calls it. That is to say, it's a, it's a form of false consciousness. It's an alienated form of consciousness. It's, it's, it's somewhat self-deceptive, or it, it, we're not realizing what's actually going on. We're lacking self-knowledge insofar as we believe that we can be objective with respect to art and history. Now, that's where he starts. Remember, that, that's sort of the, the strong case. And this would be the, the examples like the historical sciences and um, the history of art would be cases where he would probably find the most widespread agreement with his thesis. But he does believe that this is really a generalizable situation. And that has to do with what he calls um, effective history in our horizon. These are two important concepts for philosophical hermeneutics. effective history and our horizon. Um, like the name suggests, effective history refers to the way that we're affected by history, the history of which we are a part. You know, we're all very aware of the way in which our lives are affected by something that will eventually be written as the, you know, 2019, 2020 COVID-19 pandemic, you know, our, that's, but we're affected by this history. Um, but Goddard means this in, in the broadest possible sense, the way in which we're affected by the history of which we're a part. Because history, in this sense, both enables and it limits our horizon.
effective history enables and limits <clears throat> excuse me, our horizon. And in doing so, it, it enables and limits our understanding. So what do we mean by, by the horizon? Well, okay. Um, a horizon concerns, as the metaphor suggests, the um, scope of the things that we can see or we can know or understand in the metaphorical extension of the, of the concept of horizon. So it, it refers to the scope of things that we can know and understand, but, but also the limits beyond which we are not able to know or understand. And that includes not just uh, known unknowns, like things that we don't know because of our historical limitations. For example, I live at this point in history, so I don't know what's going to happen 500 years from now. And my knowledge of what happened 500 years ago is much more limited than my knowledge, in some ways, much more limited than my knowledge of things that happened five years ago. Um, so, you know, we don't know these things because of our limitations, but it also includes the unknown unknowns. It includes things like blind spots that we're unable to recognize. Things that will be recognized in the future as our blind spots in the same way that, you know, we can look back at the beliefs of people 50, 100, 150, 200, 500 years ago um, and marvel at the fact that they, they didn't recognize things that just seem so obvious to us now. Like, for example, um, let's say gender equality, right? And, but, you know, back then, I mean, pick your date. Uh, it was just taken for granted that, of course, you know, males are superior to females or something like that. Um, and so there will be things like that, that in the future, they'll look, people will look back at us and say, how could they have missed this? Well, they had a blind spot, right? There's an unknown unknown. It's things that we don't even know we don't know. But um, part of the um, methodological standpoint of philosophical hermeneutics is to uh, recognize and acknowledge that this is our situation, that we are affected by history, we're subject to effective history in this way, which enables and limits our horizon. Okay, so that gives us a sense of um, how God and Magog started in developing philosophical hermeneutics. Now, I've just been referring to we, right, we, W-E, and our, O-U-R, our, just who is this we and this are, we might ask. You know, who's this we? You know, what do you mean by we? Um, well, of course, this, this uh, refers to a presupposed community, however indeterminate its boundaries and its membership might be. And community presupposes a certain human possibility called this uh, communality, communality, the, the property of being capable of being a community. So how does this figure into hermeneutics? Well, in Gadamer's view, the communality that we call human rests on the linguistic constitution of our life world. The communality that we call human rests on the linguistic constitution of our life world. In other words, uh, shared community is rooted in shared language. Shared community is rooted in shared language. The life world, so this is another important concept. Uh, of course, as the name suggests, the, by the life world, we don't mean just the world. We don't mean just the physical universe, but we mean the world that we live in as a community and that we constitute communally, which is constituted by a shared language. So to learn a new language is to enter into a new world, but only in the sense of a life world. It doesn't mean you enter into a new physical dimension or something, or you travel to Uranus or Pluto, of course. But it means entering into a new life world, a, sh a new world that we live in and share as a community that's constituted by language. Now, of course, the many languages that there are may constitute adjacent worlds, we could call them that, adjacent worlds, that are relatively close and overlapping to each other. But they're still distinct worlds. And we can all, um, arguably at least, we might say, share a common physical world that's constituted by the universal mathematical language of science. Now this raises the question, how does such a life world come to be understood and shared in common? How does such a life world come to be understood, uh, recognized, and shared in common, which are, of course are going to be very closely related to each other? 
how does the language itself that constitutes the life world come to be and take shape? How is it formed? How is it reformed? Or are life worlds just these static things, which of course doesn't seem to be a very plausible view. We would want to say that the world that we share and live in common is, is always dynamic and evolving. So that raises the issue of how language is reformed as well as formed in relation to this life world that it constitutes. Well, Gadamer's answer would be, not surprisingly, based upon what we've said so far, it, it, it happens, this language takes shape and the world takes shape by human beings coming to reach an understanding. It's by human beings coming to reach an understanding. And that brings us back to the dialogical. I smudged out my L there, but probably the semantics is barely legible anyway. But dialogical, right? Through, through dialogue and conversation, human beings come to reach an understanding, and thereby we um, constitute a life world. Okay. But at this level of generality, the hermeneutic problem of reaching an understanding more or less coincides with the exercise and employment of reason itself. So philosophical hermeneutics, you know, becomes philosophical because it involves a certain conception of, of reason, namely a hermeneutical conception of reason. Hermeneutical as opposed to what? Well, again, as opposed to the uh, positivistic understanding of reason or the mathematical conception of reason as a form of ratiocination, of rigorous deduction from um, fixed terminology defined in axioms, that kind of idea. That's not what we have. Instead, the kind of reason that um, constitutes our life world is going to have this dialogical character. So reason, rationality, and critical thinking are themselves basically hermeneutical operations. Uh, because actually, in, you know, the, the scientific operations of ratiocination, scientific method employed through uh, repeatable experimentation, uh, also the methods of mathematics or formal symbolic logic, all of these things exist only in the context of a life world. They are supported and sustained by a life world. They don't float in the ether independently of some shared communal form of life. Uh, and so the basic form of rationality is going to be this, this dialogical form. There's a connection there between uh, reason and its basic character and, and dialogue and the hermeneutic uh, method as a result of, of the connection um, between dialogue and hermeneutics. So hermeneutics concerns the universe of the reasonable, anything and everything about which human beings can seek to reach rational agreement. And the hermeneutic task is the task of finding a common language. The hermeneutic task is the task of finding a common language that will enable agreement. Sometimes God uh, refers to this as a fusion of horizons, referring back to the horizons. I have my horizon this person that I'm trying to reach understanding and rational agreement with has their horizon. So those horizons have to come together and fuse through some kind of a dialogue. That's what hermeneutics does. So how does this reason that is hermeneutical look? How is it employed? Free up a little space here. So this reason We'll move this over here. Which is dialogical. Okay. See what I did there? We'll move this one up here. So the reason it's dialogical, he draws on two traditions for this. Uh, the tradition of rhetoric and Aristotelian phronesis, or practical philosophy. Rhetoric and Aristotelian practical philosophy, or phronesis. So, uh, very briefly, I don't want to dwell too long on this, but the rhetoric is a mode of argumentation that um, brings feeling into play, and that's why uh, Plato was such a critic of rhetoric, and he set the tone for much of the philosophical tradition following him. Because rhetoric, indeed, it, it 
relies upon an appeal to, to emotion and how intelligent you or cognitive you take that appeal to be depends upon your attitude towards how intelligent or cognitive you think the emotions are. But we don't have to get too deeply into that question now. But what Godwin is concerned with is the way in which rhetoric appeals to probability and the, these sort of socially determined probabilities. You know, what's more likely um, as a rhetorical question is an important part of a kind of mode of uh, dialogue that aims at arriving at agreement between diverse opinions. And rhetoric is, he observes, a much stronger factor, actually, in social determination than scientific rationality. In fact, it's, it's almost fair to say that scientific rationality has very little impact socially, except insofar as it becomes um, translated into rhetoric. You know, it's one thing to read scientific results about, let's say, climatology in a scientific journal, but it's quite another thing to say, you know, we're all going to die in 10 years because of climate change, right? The scientific journal just doesn't give you that emotional um, impact. You, we need to have a way of translating it into rhetoric in order for it to have a um, social determinative factor. So rhetoric is one, but, but, but Gadamer is going to say um, the philosophical cr uh, critique of rhetoric has been too one-sided. We should recognize that there's actually uh, something valuable in rhetoric. And rhetoric is an, you know, an inevitable part of dialogue and conversation. There's always going to be rhetoric involved and people are coming together in dialogue. That's the first. And this, so the second is this idea of um, Aristotelian, the Aristotelian conception of phronesis, which is difficult to translate. It's often translated as practical wisdom, as prudence is one of the traditional translations. Um, it has the sense of tact or sort of knowing how to do the right thing, how to seek the, the ethically right result or the ethically right mode or way of acting and feeling and responding and desiring. But what um, Gadamer takes from this is the idea that all knowledge is historically conditioned and doesn't possess an independent foundation in certainty. Because for Aristotle, this mode of phronesis or practical wisdom is something that you have to be brought up in a certain culture in order to acquire. You can't just teach it to someone in terms of concepts. You couldn't you know, program a computer to do it by giving them certain algorithms. It's not an algorithmic operation. It involves something more intuitive. That's one aspect. Phronesis, this practical knowledge or phronesis, uh, involves necessarily this kind of intuitive or historically conditioned aspect that can't be reducible to an algorithm. But secondly, it also involves um, the ethical dimension of conversation. That all knowledge, it, it points to the idea that insofar as all knowledge is based in dialogue and dialogical rationality, it has this ethical dimension. There's, there ha in order for there to be a dialogue, there has to be a shared um, ethical basis or shared ethical background, however thin it might be, some kind of value-laden basis. And this is true even in science. If you think about, you know, what makes science possible? What's, what makes scientific rationality and discourse possible? Well, there are scientific values. Things like Occam's razor, you know, don't make unnecessarily complicated theories. Uh, repeatability, efficiency, communicability, uh, you know, the mathematization, of the, of the modes of expression. All these things are, are values. And so they go along with a kind of shared background of, of, sh of, of an ethical basis that scientists share with each other. Of course, we don't normally think of this as an ethical basis, but um, that's one of the connections with Aristotle's notion of phronesis, that in order to have an ethical life, people need to have this shared sort of tacit understanding that we share these values without even necessarily making them explicit and certainly not following them as explicit rules. You have to have a kind of intuitive sense of, look, that theory is just unnecessarily complicated or the, the sense that there's something fishy about the way in which this lab is being run, right? And it has to do with being brought up within a scientific culture and in a scientific ethic. Okay, so enough on that, but that gives you at least a rough sense. So perhaps the most important connection between hermeneutic rationality and the ethical dimension of existence has to do with the way in which they come together in the act of dialoguing with another person. So Gadamer describes Plato's dialogues as his constant companions. 
and Plato's dialogues serve for him as the ideal model of philosophical discourse. He doesn't read Plato primarily as the founder of Platonism or Platonic metaphysics, but rather as an ideal exemplar of a particular mode of philosophizing. What is this mode of philosophizing? Some features of it. One is that it's communal. Okay, so that's kind of obvious. Uh, but it's worth noting because philosophy oftentimes has the reputation of being something that needs to be undertaken alone. You know, think about Descartes in his, in, in his um, alone in his uh, meditative study. Um, and that, of course, helps to facilitate his becoming skeptical about the existence of anything outside his mind. But that's uh, not the mode that you find in Plato's dialogues. It's a communal mode of philosophizing. It's also humble. The outcome of, especially the so-called, you know, the more Socratic of the Platonic dialogues is often to point out the ignorance that human beings have or to point out the um, foolishness of people who have pretensions to more knowledge than they actually have and to deflate our human arrogance and hubris. So it's a humble mode. It also, of course, to dialogue with someone implies, I don't already know everything. I mean, I'm not just lecturing to you. I'm, dial I'm dialoguing with you. That's a difference. Um, an important difference in terms of what I'm saying about myself, right? I'm not just saying you listen to me because I'm the one who knows everything and you know nothing. But in, in asking you questions and dialoguing with you, I'm putting ourselves on an equal footing. So there's a kind of humility there. And this can also lead to um, a particular, potentially transformative outcome. You know, I might learn something from you, and if we're dealing with serious questions, as Plato often does in his dialogues, questions about what's virtue, what's piety, what's the good, you know, these sorts of questions can lead me to a profound changing of my life, uh, potentially. But it, at a minimum, in a really deep, serious conversation, neither party typically remains totally unchained. And then finally, and this will be very important for him too, It's open-ended or non-total or totalizing. Uh, in a certain sense, dialogues always end somewhat arbitrarily. They can always be continued. Uh, as we know, you know, we have a good conversation with someone, you know, no one wants to hang up. <laughs> uh, there's this sense, of course, there could be a power struggle going on there too as to who hangs up on the other person, but um, leave that to one side. I mean, if it's a really good conversation that both people are engaged, it can go on and on and on and on. And when it does finally end, you know, it ends just maybe as a result of the physical limitations of the people involved, right? But um, Goddard takes an important philosophical lesson from the way in which Platonic dialogue has this open-ended, non-total character. Okay, so as a student of Heidegger, Gadamer is deeply influenced by the Heideggerian conception of truth, which is a conception of truth as simultaneously exposure and concealment. That is connected with this notion of open-endedness truth. On Heidegger's understanding, there you go. Truth is exposure and concealment. I don't know if you can read that, but truth is exposure and concealment. Uh, truth is always the coming to light of something, but every coming to light of something obscures something else. You know, think about the visual metaphor. To see objects, they have to be not transparent. If they were transparent, you'd just see through them and you wouldn't see them. But insofar as they aren't transparent, they obscure something behind them. And that metaphor serves as kind of the model of truth as such. Uh, truth is, is aletheia in the, in the Greek sense, unconcealment. Um, it implies that what is spoken out as true, even if it's recognized as true, is not everything. The concepts in which thinking formulates itself, he says, stand up against a wall of darkness. That's on uh, page 188, I believe. The concepts in which thinking formulates itself stand up against a wall of darkness. 
So for this reason, every dialogue with the thinking of a thinker is an unending conversation. That's the connection between this open-endedness or non-total character. Because, uh, in short, no philosopher has the, has the whole truth. You know, there's this fundamental agreement here with a theme that we saw emphasized very much in Wallace Stevens. Um, and for all I know, Stevens may have been influenced by Heidegger. I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not a Stevens scholar. I'm not sure if you read Heidegger. But this idea that, you know, not everything can be spoken by one philosophy. Everything that formulates itself as a philosophy is always going to be partial. It's not going to be complete. Uh, incidentally, this was an idea that um, Ralph Waldo Emerson also em emphasized, and certainly Stevens would have been aware of that um, from his study at Harvard. Anyhow, uh, back to Gadamer. So every dialogue with the thinking of a thinker is always going to be an unending, unending conversation, and that leads to modesty and always recognizing the potential superiority of the com conversation partner's position. Now, Hegel uh, was the totalizing philosopher par excellence. Um, we're talking about that. This Hegel, if you're not familiar, H-E-G-E-L, uh, Hegel. -E G-W-F uh, -E uh, Hegel, I believe I've referred to him in the past in this course. And Gadamer is more sympathetic to Hegel than Heidegger was, but he admits that Hegel has this shortcoming in his ambitions for philosophy and wanting to be a totalizer. Philosophy goes on and on as long as humanity does. It's never going to reach completion or absolute knowledge. And in this respect, Gadamer follows his teacher Heidegger, who criticized Hegel on this point. Here's where we come back to the connection of philosophy with poetry. We've already seen how Heidegger uses Hertelin to open a door between philosophy and poetry and to invite us to walk through it, leaving philosophy behind, at least metaphysical philosophy, totalizing philosophy behind in favor of a deeper mode of thinking that's more poetic. Well, what about Gadamer? So Gadamer first sees Heidegger's choice of Hertelin as an alternative to Hegel, who was his close friend and colleague at seminary. So it's it's, it's fun to, um, or tempting to sort of pair Heidegger, and, sorry, not Heidegger, but uh, Hegel and Hertelin as two opposing paths, right? And philosophy can take one or the other, either the Hegelian path of trying to totalize or the path of Hertelin, which um, um, Heidegger and Gadamer's reading is more in line with this kind of conception of philosophy, communal, humble, transformative, and open-ended or non-totalizing. Gadamer takes away from Heidegger's idea of the significance of Hertelin as an alternative to Hegel, the idea that uh, poetry is a corrective for the ideal of objective determination and the hubris of concepts. Poetry acknowledges and protects and preserves the fluidity of language, the fluidity of language that's necessary for good conversation. You know, if you and I are coming to each other speaking different languages, so to speak, and we're trying to come to agreement and understanding, you may not understand what I'm saying in the first way I try to formulate it. I have to be flexible. My, I have to be capable of expressing the same idea in different ways. And that's a kind of poetic fluidity. We've all witnessed probably examples of people who can only express their ideas in one set of concepts. You know, oftentimes, we, you know, journalists are terrible at this. They have their, their cliches that they use to express their ideas. And if you ask them to express it in another way, I mean, who knows if they could. Maybe some of them could, maybe some of them, some of them definitely couldn't. You know, they're used to speaking in these kind of straitjacketed ways through a fixed terminology. And poetry that pr pr protects and preserves this fluidity of language that's necessary for good conversation. Certainly, terminal, terminological fixity has its place in certain contexts, like narrow scientific contexts, but it kills good conversation. It, it makes conversation robotic if you just have to rely on the same formulations and you lack flexibility in the way in which you can express yourself. So um, the greatest philosophers, Gadamer observes, always found their own language. The, the philosopher, like the poet, stirs up the observation powers of speech. And yet, even poetry remains a form of speech in which concepts to co come together in relatedness. He says on page 192, 
Hence, the hermeneutic task consists in learning how to determine the special place of poetry in the context of the binding force of language, where the conceptual is always in play. How does language become art? How does language become art? This question poses itself here, not only because the art of interpretation always involves forms of speech and text, and because poetry too involves linguistic creations and text. Poetic creations are creations in a novel sense. They are texts in an eminent way. Language emerges here in its full autonomy. It stands for itself and raises itself to this standing position, whereas words are normally overtaken by the directed intentions of the speech that leaves them behind. So hermeneutics as the art of interpretation always concerns text. But what exactly is a text? And here he's suggesting that, well, we might try to answer this key question for hermeneutics of all sorts. Any kind of hermeneutics has to answer the question, what's the text? In some at least implicit way. Uh, so what is the text? Well, we might try to answer this by examining the text par excellence. What is the text in an eminent way, which is poetry? That's what he's suggesting here. In poetry, language is autonomous. It stands for itself. And so poetry is going to have a special importance and special relevance for uh, the development of the practices of hermeneutics and, and hermeneutic rationality, as we've just discussed. Now, the specific hermeneutic problem that arises in connection with poetry, which will be most deeply explored in Gadamer's study of Paul saint on is uh, this question. Uh, which he discusses at the end of 92 and 193, the end of this essay. Granted that a special sort of communication proceeds from poetry, with whom does it take place? Granted that a special sort of communication proceeds from poetry, with whom does this communication take place? Who is poetry, a piece of poetry communicating with? Well, what are the options? I mean, the, the obvious thing we want to say is, well, Duh, it's communicating with the reader. But a little reflection reveals that doesn't get us very far. Which reader? I mean, think about it. Did, you know, we just went through these difficult poems of Stevens and Eliot. Did you get out of those poems the same thing I got out of it? Some of you did, at least in part. Probably no one did completely, right? So, I mean, there's this question of which reader, especially with the modern type of poetry, the more modernist type of poetry. And that's what Paul Ceylon exemplifies more than even Stevens and Eliot did, a very difficult poet. So, you know, who is this poetry communicating with? Which reader? What sort of reader is it communicating with? And poetry suggests, assuming that all understanding is dialogical, a dialogical relationship of a unique kind. That's where we begin with Gadamer's specific interest in poetry from a hermeneutic perspective. Okay, so we'll want to keep all that in mind when we go through uh, his discussion of uh, Paul Ceylon in, in future videos.